Great, thanks for the, uh, those uh, really uh, exciting uh, results. So uh, we have some time for um, discussion and questions. And uh, so do I see any hands in the audience? Yeah, so right over here. <laughs> um, hi, Roberta. Hi, good morning. Um, well, thank you, uh, Jin, for a really nice talk. Um, Jin and Shumak, come on up. <laughs> I have a, a question for you, um, a couple questions, actually. One is that, um, so you showed us that the anisotropy difference between peridotite and eclogite at this window of 300 is to 400 or something kilometers is really large, um, and that would be the best window to, for seismologists to try to detect eclogite. Um, I, I'm just wondering, the, the eclogite's less, still less anisotropic than the peridotite at, that, at those depths, correct? And yes. s And so... You know, the lack of anisotropy uh, could also, couldn't it also just reflect that the minerals in a peridotite are not aligned? For example, the olivine's not aligned. Absolutely. So it would be a little, would it be ambiguous then? I mean, if you had a lower uh, anisotropy at that depth, that it could still be peridotite, it may just not be that the, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That is why texture is another very important information we need to take into account. In this case, we are just estimating the capability of this rock to produce anisotropy under yeah. similar flow field kind of condition. Right. right. You know, so it's absolutely possible. That is why incorporating not only just anisotropy, but also the absolute P wave shear wave velocity as well as right. density, all these information together yeah. will be a good tool to cross check right. with each other. So just based on anisotropy, that's not reliable. And my, my second question relates to what uh, some of the eclogite that is in the mantle may have originated from Archean uh, basalts that might have been recycled. And I think we know that they are compositionally different from mid-ocean ridge basalts. Uh, they tend to be higher MGO contents, probably lower, uh, may not have a silica phase, especially if they went through a partial melting in the subduction setting. So um, have you thought, have you investigated those alternative compositions uh, for you know what might be Archean uh, eclogites, which is what we often see in the xenolith suites, for example, in kimberlites? Yes, absolutely. I uh, that's that's the that's the best thing I think to to come to this symposium because I get the information from you, an expert, you know, on this is this eclogites. The information I calculated are based on previous studies. Basically, those are natural samples, like eclogite dizziness, but I have no idea where they are from. Uh, oh, yes, they are from South Africa, but I have no idea about the history of those materials. So I just sort of calculate these two M, M member cases. But it's definitely extremely valuable to check with, you know, the real, we know that, you know, archaean eclogite, what kind of composition of it to calculate according to those compositions. Absolutely. And that's exactly the way I should do. <laughs> we have a question over here on the, on the right. Uh, uh, once again, a very nice talk. I'd like to follow up uh, uh, Roberta's comment. The, um, the cosite uh, bearing actagites are extremely rare. So um, to consider that as a, a uniformitarian opening statement uh, from what we see as xenoliths coming out of kimberlites in particular uh, is um, incorrect. I mean, that's the point. Secondly, we have a complete range of ectogites from 20 to 70 to 30 to 50, 50 percent. Thirdly, there are many ectogites that do show a preferred orientation to them, but for the most part, as we saw yesterday, they're not, they're equigranular. And so shape anisotropy, does, for the most part, does not exist in eclogite. The, the third point to be made, following up on Roberta's comment, is that we've now established, and it's becoming increasingly so, that there are essentially two major compositional varieties of eclogite. The high magnesium ones, greater than 16% MGO, and the lower ones. Now, there's another major difference mineralogically, and that is that the lower MGO ectogites are the ones that contain uh, the accessory minerals of diamond, graphite, corundum, kyanite, and cosite. So there is this, this major distinction uh, mineralogically and bulk chemistry.
Thank you very much. Yes, um, the, the two M M members I calculated, like the, the one which I believe is more, I, I assert as more sort of like continental actually has a, uh, actually has a higher iron, iron content, a lower uh, magnesium number compared with the other one. But I'm not sure whether exactly you reproduce what you're referring to. So, but there's definitely a lot of things, a lot more that I need to learn from the real petrologists. <laughs> That would be great. Thank you. So we have a que question over here with the yeah, mic. My yeah. question is for Chemek. It has to do with the high pressure experiments on the orthopyroxene. Do you observe twinning induced by the high pressure? Uh, yes, that's a good question. One of the motivations we had to, uh, to look for these reversible changes is to find some kind of uh, defects that could be a signature that natural samples went through this transition. Um, so. There's a twinning that accompanies the transformation from orthopyroxine to the first high pressure phase that changes symmetry, but it's completely reversible, including the twinning. <laughs> so the, when you release pressure, the sample detwins. We, we didn't find any uh, quenchable uh, kinds of defects. Question in the back. back. Oh, Ross, hi. <laughs> Good morning. Fifty GPA range. I thought I was li not even turned on. Okay, the quality of data that you can obtain in the twenty to fifty GPA pressure range is very impressive, and that reflects, I know, a lot of hard investment and hard work in uh, methodologies and uh, also in data reduction. And that's happened over what the last twenty twenty five years. Where do you see things going and what problems are we going to address with these methods over the next 75 years, 100 <laughs> years? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think there is definitely a future for this discipline of science. Uh, these are, as, as you uh, very well know, uh, these are super difficult experiments that uh, are affected by many uh, factors that the high pressure devices that we use uh, introduce. Um, Synchrotron experiments are definitely not the only solution, but they are a very convenient solution because we have the beam that is so much brighter and can be focused to a much smaller spot. So uh, we, we can address things that we cannot uh, so easily uh, with, with uh, home instruments, home lab instruments. I, I think the, the general tendency uh, that we have seen over the last uh, five or so years, and uh, we are just making first steps in this uh, direction. Uh, there will definitely uh, be many more developments are uh, looking at cases where the samples are in between single crystal and powder. So uh, these are idealized experiments where we try to have the starting sample either represent uh, an ideal powder with small grain size and random distribution of orientations, or we try to work with a really nice single crystal. There are a lot of phase changes that destroy crystals. They turn single crystal into a powder. There are a lot of samples that you cannot find a good single crystal to start with. So working with uh, more complex, more realistic samples that are multi-grain, uh, perhaps multi-phase, uh, looking at uh, transformations that are not only uh, physical transformations, not only uh, structural rearrangements of atoms, but chemical changes as well, uh, chemical reactions with these synchrotron methods. That's, that's, another, uh, that's another direction that I think we are going uh, into. Uh, so I, I think the future really is uh, a micro-petrology uh, in devices like, uh, like diamond anvil cells, looking at that more complex uh, phenomena, more complex processes, yeah. more realistic ones. Yeah. Jun, you want to respond? Add one more thing. I think there are, there, from my perspective, a little bit different, no, slightly different, uh, is like I think there are two things we, can, we are aiming. One is pushing up the pressure and temperature range we were able to reach. That's definitely one direction. The other is to work on the materials which people consider are too difficult to work on before, such as lower symmetry materials. So these are the two, two directions we can push toward, I, th I think, from my perspective. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think, um, you know, we, uh, the two talks that were presented today are just give a glimpse of one, sort of one area that compress, well, one area, a, a, a general area that, com that Compress focuses on, but we could have also had talks today about the Earth's core or about super Earths 
or about the mantle of Mars. So, so there are a whole bunch of really exciting science problems that can be addressed by synchrotron uh, studies like the ones that we had here today. And you know, we could obviously spend two days talking about that or more. Um, but uh, you know, I really see a bright future in this and uh, lots of exciting experiments to, to, uh, uh, for the next 75 years. Uh, maybe time for one more question? If I might. Add, I think the doing the experiments on on multi component or multi phase systems would be important because although you showed some fantastic experiments let 's say on single crystal or single phase diopsides, of course when in in a mantle assemblage that diopside is dissolving in majorite, and so those transformations are not relevant in the actual mantle, even though they 're of course very interesting from a mineral physics perspective yeah. And, you know, we, uh, we highlighted today a work that was carried out in the, with the diamond anvil cell, but a major, a major um, focus for compress is also the large volume press. And uh, that, that's, uh, that allows us to, to, you know, just like we're moving from uh, doing um, experiments at one bar to uh, the, the development of the piston cylinder, now we're taking, the, of course, the multi anvil uh, to, to uh, you know, its highest pressures, uh, but also large enough volume so that we can study real rocks and, and, look, at, and look at real petrology under high pressure and, and have it be as realistic as possible. I'm a big proponent of that, I've always been. And, um, and so, but I think what we're seeing here with Compress and these sorts of studies is that you, you, have, uh, you have two things that are very complementary. One is studying the, the simple systems and understanding them extremely well and understanding the basic fundamentals and then, and then moving over to the complexity of the real earth. And I think that those two things together are uh, a, a wonderful balance to have. Um, so that's how we see it. Yeah, thanks a lot.